But where was me Mac Pro? Also in this video, why the 13 inch M2 MacBook Pro is a thing. Can Apple hand off more to the GPU and neural engines in future? Thunderbolt 5, will we get ProMotion 5K? How scary is the unpatchable M1 vulnerability? And M2 Pro and M2 Max, will they be three nanometer? And this video is sponsored by Aura. Want the latest Apple news, leaks and rumors? Subscribe and ring the bell. Hello you beautiful people, this is iCave Dave and we're going through your questions today because, well basically you covered everything I wanted to talk about anyway so we might as well do it in that format. First up, Rico the MLG Pro asks, iCave answers, why was there no new Mac Pro at WWDC and when do you think we might get the new Mac Pro? Okay so there's a couple of approaches to take with this one. Now first of all, there have been a lot of people thinking that we might have been getting a new Mac Pro with M2 built in, basically M2 Ultra, and a couple of those in the first M2 thing, which didn't really make too much sense to me, but that's what a lot of people were saying. They were thinking we were going to jump straight to the M2 Ultra, put a couple of them in a Mac Pro. Yes, it would blow people away. They wouldn't need particularly high yields on it, and, uh, and that was what we were expecting. Now, we're going to talk later in uh, the video about how M uh, M2 Pro and M2 Max and M2 Ultra could be on a different node, which we mentioned in the intro, uh, but we'll come to that later. There is a potential that it might be made on the smaller production node, which at the moment is just not yielding enough, which basically means that out of all of the chips that are made, you're basically throwing away more than half of them right now on that process, which is why it doesn't make any sense to use that for the main production. Now, if we assume that it was going to be with M1 Ultras and just multiple of those, uh, then that is still a potential that that still might be announced, even though we've had M2 announced for the base level products, it might still be that we get a Mac Pro with multiple M1 Ultras inside it, or M2 Ultras, but I think M1 Ultra was what they were probably going to put in there uh, in multiple configurations, so two or four of those. I think the thing that's actually slowed them down, because I think they wanted to actually launch this straight away at WWDC and sell it right away, I think the big thing that slowed them down is they did all their production and all of their marketing materials, including that mini LED 27 inch display, the Studio Display XDR if you like, or the Studio Display Pro, whatever they're going to call it. And I think because of the production issues around that, that it's now been pushed back to October, I think that's why it's not been announced. Now, why would that slow down the Mac Pro? Well, I think the reason is because we have the studio display at this point, if they were to announce the Mac Pro with the studio display Pro and neither of them are coming until later in the year, which is basically what happened with the Pro Display XDR. You have to remember at that point, there was no other Apple display on the market. Whereas now, because we have the studio display, if you tell people there's a mini LED version of it coming later in the year, that's going to kill the sales potentially of the lower end model. Only if people actually want the mini LED and only if the price is going to be reasonably competitive, because I think the big thing with the studio display is that it's at a vaguely more reasonable price than we'd seen with the pro displays in the past being around about five thousand dollars instead of you know fifteen hundred sixteen hundred um so i think that's probably a big part of the reason now we will talk about the three nanometer m2 pros m2 maxes m2 ultras later in the video but i think that is potentially why we haven't seen it yet when everyone at least thought we'd get a preview of this Mac Pro at this point. I think that display being delayed might actually be the reason. Team Kinetics asks, iCave answers, why did Apple keep the 13 inch MacBook Pro around? With the camera, screen, speakers, spec bump to the MacBook Air, the tiny difference between the two models now makes less sense than ever when the Air now looks like an objectively better device. The difference in performance is negligible despite the fan on the 13 inch MacBook Pro. At least they kept the M1 Air around to cover the sub $1,000 market. When will Apple kill off the 13 inch Pro or at least replace it with something in line with the new models? I am as surprised as you are to see this still here. Um, believe me, I really don't understand why it exists. Uh, we talked in the past about the potential for removing the touch bar, giving it, maybe even taking away the backlight from the keyboards and making the MacBook the base level that goes at that thousand dollar price with M2 inside. Apparently that's not the case either. Um, but I think the M2 is probably still not at full yield either, which might be the reason that we've had these delays. Um, but yeah, it's 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 baffling to me why anyone would want the fatter version of the uh, the M2 MacBook Air 
with a worse display, a worse camera, being heavier, having the old style design, not getting MagSafe, only having the two ports, which includes charging. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's an absolute mystery to me. I do think we could have seen the 14 inch version get an M2 inside it and as long as it still had the extra connectivity that would have probably been a compelling option at around about $1,500 or $1,600 but at this point it's just weird. I really don't know why it's there. I don't know why it stayed at the price it did. I don't know why it still has a touch bar. I don't know any of these things. I don't know. I This might be the worst video I've ever made. I haven't got an answer for you. In terms of when it will be replaced, the next event, hopefully. Don't think it will, but maybe. Maybe they've just got loads of those unibodies knocking around that they still need to sell because uh, nobody bought uh, the M1 with it compared to the MacBook Air. Armin Dressler asks, IK Vances, more and more applications leverage the power of GPU and MPU cores for performance and completely new features. Apple adds GPU and MPU driven features in iOS and macOS. PyTorch Machine Learning got a 10 times speed bump on the M1 Ultra by using the GPU. Blender rendering got faster. A company called GPU Audio works on using the GPU power for real-time audio processing, including Apple Silicon support next year. Nvidia, AMD, and even Intel sell processors for GPU computing. Feels like we are just at the beginning of something big. Do you think Apple will focus more on GPU and MPU development instead of CPU? The A15 and M2 are good examples of that. So this is something that I definitely wanted to touch on in this video. I've seen Max Tech's video uh, and Vadim was talking about how this 18% increase in uh, CPU performance is uh, disappointing. I'm sorry? I'm sorry, what? Between Intel generations, it tends to be, what, 7%, 8% maybe? Apple comes out with 18% and because it's not the two to three times boost that we had uh, going from Intel to M1, everyone's disappointed. No, this is a great upgrade, the M2. Yes, it's a, a fun combination of the efficiency cores and the performance cores. If the efficiency cores are making up a big chunk of that difference, great. That means the performance cores aren't even firing up, which means better battery life, which means less heat, which means the M2 MacBook Air can actually do even more with its no fan and uh, and feel better all the time. I'm very happy with 18% improvements. That wasn't your question, but I needed to get that out of my system. In terms of GPU and neural engine stuff, yes, I absolutely think Apple's going to be leaning on this. And they're taking more and more off of those cores anyway, off of the CPU cores, because we've got the better media engine in M2 too. So the media engine is apparently making video uh, performance in terms of uh, in terms of editing about 38% better, whereas you've only got 18% improvement in the CPU, so it doesn't make any difference. With my M1, the GPU barely even moves when we're uh, when we're rendering videos, when we're rendering these videos out. It's very confusing to me. Um, but yeah, I think being able to offload different tasks to different parts of the cores makes a massive amount of sense. And for Apple, because they've got the unified memory architecture as well, that is the biggest, biggest advantage that they've got. And I think anyone that's talking about moving uh, RAM, moving memory away from that unified uh, architecture to make a Mac Pro that is able to use more RAM, I think it's a bonkers idea because I think it's really going to slow down um, the system in general. I don't think it's a great idea. I think that Apple is absolutely making use of these neural engines and the GPU for a whole bunch of stuff. And... Uh, Remember, M1 was the first generation, even with M1 Pro, M1 Max, M1 Ultra, still first generation cores in the middle of there. Apple's definitely got more up their sleeves for this. Evan Rogers asks, IK Vances, when do you think the next Thunderbolt standard will be released? And do you think it will offer 80 gigabits per second that would allow a studio display with ProMotion? And yes, um, Thunderbolt 5 hasn't been announced by Intel at this point. Um, there is also questions around... Uh, Thunderbolt 5 for Apple because uh, Thunderbolt is basically supposed to be exclusive to Intel processors. That's one of the things you don't get AMD chips, as far as I'm aware, that can use Thunderbolt. However, um, Apple was uh, involved in setting up of Thunderbolt, I believe. I think it was a collaboration with Apple and Intel at the beginning. So there might be some stuff around that. But I think it is going to add a lot of cost for Apple to keep going with Thunderbolt. So there's a potential that they might even move away from Thunderbolt as their main connector, which would confuse a lot of people. And uh, wouldn't it be hilarious if as soon as the EU says you've got to use the USB-C connector that everyone else goes, 
you know, it's not it's not fast enough anymore, so they moved to something else. It does look like Thunderbolt 5 is going to be using the USB-C connection. Don't get me wrong, there should be backwards compatibility there. But it kind of annoyed me when I went from having Thunderbolt 2 on my MacBook Air to go into Thunderbolt 3 and all of a sudden it's USB-C. And yeah, uh, I, th I think this common connector thing is great as far as it goes. Not that that's what we're talking about. In terms of 80 gigabits per second to do ProMotion on a studio display, that would be great. Still only going to be one. And yes, ProMotion is 120 hertz and this would be at 5K as well, so it's a huge amount of data to be moving backwards and forwards. It's going to be a chunky boy cable. Maybe it's going to be optical. Don't know. But yeah, I think that is probably what will happen. But as I say, there is no timeline, no roadmap for this at this point, so I don't think we should hold our breath for that. don't think that's uh, really even on the horizon at the moment. If you look at laptops, you see anything with a high refresh rate is also low resolution. It tends to be 1080p. 1440p really at the maximum if you're doing 120 uh, hertz however hdmi 2.1 can carry 4k at 120 hertz from memory i just don't know if there's actually as much demand for that as people expect i think people would love it if they got it i don't think anyone is not buying a macbook pro because it's got hdmi 2.0 on it not 2.1 brian data asks ik answers how worried should we be about the recent reports of an unpatchable security vulnerability in the m1 series of chips related to the port pointer authentication codes or pac number one bear in mind i am not a security expert i have not uh, done a huge amount of stuff around this but uh, pointer authentication codes as far as i can tell is basically um, an authentication within apps and this basically does allow you to get around the last line of security within the m1 chip however from the research that i've very briefly done and as i say I, i'm probably missing some stuff on this it basically involves guessing the pointer authentication code which from what i can find out appears to be a 64-bit string which uh, if you wanted to brute force that to try all of the potential codes would take around 700 billion times the age of the universe which is a while um, but obviously you don't have to try every code you only have to keep going until you find it so on average that's going to be halfway through so 350 billion times the uh, age of the universe which is 13.8 billion years i think something around that so you know, I mean, I don't think it's something that can be actively exploited. I don't think it is a major vulnerability. It's a bug. Yes. Uh, is it something that is likely to be exploited? No. So I don't think there's any massive issues around it, but it's good that it's been found and it's good that Apple is aware of it and that they are able to then look at this in future and make sure that this is another bug that doesn't happen. Because obviously in future, computing speeds will increase. Uh, whether it will increase that much it's going to take a while uh but yeah we don't want it in the next generation and that's uh that's fine it's really good that researchers are looking at these things and finding potential issues uh but if they've actually been able to exploit it i would be very surprised uh, i think it's just that that exploit does exist if you happen to know the authentication code if you guessed it Brian Data asks, iCave answers, iCave Dave, what do you make of recent reports that the M2 Pro and Max chips will be on 3 nanometer silicon? Will this chip be based on the A15 in the iPhone 13 or the A16 in the iPhone 14? Does this foreshadow something that will end up in the chips for the Apple Silicon Mac Pro? And what does it mean for branding when M2 is 5 nanometer silicon? Okay. Let's get into this. So my understanding in the past was that the M2 would be based on the A15 because it is that next generation, that made sense. I thought that would all be on 5 nanometer. that would make sense. Having done a bit more research, it does turn out that you can take a chip that is designed for a 5 nanometer process and you can just shrink it down and you will get some performance increases, which is nice. Um, I don't think, however, that the uh, M2 Pro, M2 Max, M2 Ultras will be based on the A16 from next year because that doesn't make any sense for the, uh, for the pacing it would make a lot more sense to do it based on M2. We've had our huge jump. I feel like the M2 series in general will sell less well than M1 did, and that's fine. And I think M1 in the MacBook Air, for example, will still continue to sell pretty well for a little while because it is that entry point. I think we might even keep around an M1 Mac Mini as well, but also bring in a new Mac Mini pretty soon, maybe as soon as September, October time. That'd be great. Um, and I think we might also see M2 Pro and M2 Max in September or October, probably October, because September's really for 
iPhones, Apple Watch, iPad maybe. So I think that's when we'll probably see those. We'll probably see M2 come into a iPad Pro as well. That would make sense. Uh, but I do think that the M2 Pros that we see then have a 50-50 chance probably of being on 5 nanometer or on 3 nanometer. I really don't know. Uh, I think it would be great if it goes to 3 nanometer. I would expect that the yields will still be too low and I think we might see the 5 nanometer plus technology being used for these and then M3 gets the big jump again. So it almost becomes a TikTok. I still don't accept that this is a fill in the gaps chip. I don't believe that the, that's what is going on here, but I do believe that we have had a, a difficulty. But bear in mind, when I first started making these videos, everyone said five nanometers is basically the limit of how small you can go. Anything at four nanometers or lower is going to have the issues of quantum tunneling with uh, electrons moving from one side to the other side of a transistor without actually passing through it. Um, and there's no way that you can go any smaller than five nanometers. Now we're complaining that the three nanometers aren't here quickly enough. And it's been a year and a half since I started making these videos, nearly, yeah, nearly two years. And then people are going to be asking exactly the same about is three nanometers the limit? And then we're going to go to 2.5 maybe. Maybe we just don't go whole nanometers from now on. Maybe we just need a new scale to talk about. But I don't think we've reached the limits of physics just yet. But we are getting blooming close. But every time we move down one nanometer now, if we go from five nanometers to four nanometers, that's basically a 20% reduction. If we go from five to three, that's a 40% reduction. If we go from four to three, that's a 25% reduction. If we go from three to two, that's a 33% reduction. So we can't accelerate at this pace forever and I understand why it's getting difficult for this to happen because we are getting into such small sizes now that um, yeah it's not really sustainable and this video is sponsored by Aura. Do you know what the fastest growing crime in America is? For years the crime rate has been surging and affecting millions of Americans. I'm talking about identity theft and there's a new victim every 14 seconds. Yet despite this those who have their identity stolen are often shocked when it happens. Imagine trying to lock into your email account only to see that your password has changed hours ago. Then you start getting notifications of activity from your bank, credit cards, crypto accounts. That's when the feelings of panic, fear, anxiety, paranoia, disbelief, shock, anger and frustration and guilt set in. That's why I'm excited to partner with Aura who is sponsoring this video. Aura is an identity theft protection, fraud monitoring and a VPN, password management software and antivirus software combined into one easy to use app. Aura monitors the dark web for your emails, passwords and social security numbers and sends you alerts fast right to your phone and email. When it comes to fraud, every second matters. Connect your credit cards and bank to be notified of any changes up to four times faster than Aura's competitors. Their VPN allows you to stay anonymous online by keeping your browsing history and personal information safe and encrypted. And their antivirus software that will block malware and viruses before they infect your devices. Sadly for me, Aura is currently only available in the US, but if you check out their free trial, be sure to let me know in the comments how many times your information has been detected on the dark web. Protect you and your family from America's fastest growing crime. Try Aura free for two weeks and see if any of your family's personal information has already been compromised. Start your free trial at aura.com forward slash iCaveDave. Thank you to Aura for sponsoring the show. Cool, thank you so much for watching this video guys. Thank you so much to all of our Patreon members for helping to support this channel and uh, we will have more cool stuff coming for you in the coming weeks. If you've got an iCave answer you would like me to answer in a future video, hashtag iCaveAnswers down in the comments section. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you in the next one.